Okay, hello. Um, why I'm so dark, but oh well. So, yeah, well, that makes it worse. Oh well. Um, so, uh, First of all, I have to apologize. Um, a bunch of people showed up for the classes earlier this week that where there were no classes. <laughs> um, I don't I don't know why. I mean, I felt like that was pretty clear on the syllabus, and also I mentioned it a bunch of times. Uh, but I guess. I should have sent out an email reminder or something. Anyway, I apologize to those people who who showed up for the Zoom session and didn't find anything here. Um, this. How did that get on? Uh, no end of technical problems. That's that we'll have to do. Um, all right, so I'm going to say um, briefly something about the names of substances that I never got to talk about last time, and then I'm going to go on to the new material about knowledge. And oh, there's my marker. Okay. So names of substances. Um, is basically a subtopic of general names, right? Because when Locke talks about names of substances, he's mostly talking about general names for substances, not proper names, right? So like not Bucephalus, which is the name of a substance, but like horse, which is the name of a type of substance. Um, Um, and this is the, here's this is the basic idea of what he's talking about. So it's book three, chapter three, section fifteen, on page three seventy four. Um, uh, um, Tis true, there is ordinarily supposed a real constitution on which any collection of simple ideas coexisting must depend. Right? So, like, if the simple ideas that constitute the properties of a horse <clears throat> tend to come in together, we suppose, I mean, I think he may be using suppose here in a kind of tactical sense. We like place under, we suppose a real constitution. We hypothesize is, is the Greek version of this, um, of suppose some real constitution on which that collection of ideas depends. And tis past doubt that there must be some real constitution on which any collection of simple ideas coexisting must depend. 
Sorry, I, I skipped something. Tis true that there is ordinarily supposed a real constitution of the sorts of things. Sorry. And tis past doubt that there must be some real constitution on which any collection of simple ideas coexisting must depend. Okay. I'm not doing well so far tonight. <laughs> um, but, uh, right, we usually, when we form a sort of things like horse, we usually suppose that there's a real constitution that all horses have in common. And it's true, is past doubt, that if all, if horses are all the things that, um, um, have a certain collection of properties that we've put into our complex idea, there must be some real constitution that's uh, behind those properties coming together. But it being evident that things are ranked under names into sorts or species only as they agree to certain abstract ideas to which we have annexed those names, the essence of each genus or sort comes to be nothing but that abstract idea which the general or sortal name stands for. So what he's saying is, um, there's something like there's all those there's all these so okay, here's our idea of horse. This is a complex idea, and um, you know, if you remember the classification of complex ideas, is it a mode? No. Is it a relation? No. It's an idea of substance. It's a general idea of substance, right? Because it applies to all horses. So it contains certain simple ideas, whatever they are. <laughs> Um, uh, and, um, the horses are all the things that, so he, he's a little bit, um, loose in the way he talks about ideas in this passage, right? He's, he says that the simple ideas coexist in the horses, but of course, what, what coexists in the horses are the qualities that cause us to perceive these simple ideas. It's those, right? So the, the horse has various qualities that it has various powers to affect me in such a way that I perceive these various simple ideas that, that make up the complex idea of horse. And he's saying, well, it's certainly true that if all these things have just these qualities, they must have something in common by virtue of which they have those qualities. Now, I mean, this is a little bit, I don't think it's certainly true. I don't think that's what he should have said, because after all, it could kind of be a coincidence, right? Like it it could be that one of them has all those qualities for one reason and another one has all those qualities for another reason. Um, but I guess maybe the idea is that that's very improbable, <laughs> right? Like it wouldn't be rational to reach that conclusion. I don't know. Anyway, what he says is they certainly have something in common, but um we don't sort them all as horses right this is the sort horse it contains all horses and meanwhile there's other things like cows <laughs> This is a cow, and it's not included in the sort horse. Um, how did we determine? How did we sort it? How did we sort all the horses together and the cows uh, not with the horses? 
Well, not by consulting this real constitution and saying, these all have this real constitution and this one doesn't. Because Locke says, although there certainly is a real constitution, we don't know what it is. It has something to do with the very small bodies that make up a horse. Um, and they're much too small. We'll never know anything about them. Now, I mean, one interesting question about this is, has our situation changed fundamentally? Like when we do, when we say what gold is, like we know we no longer say gold is something that's yellow and fusible and soluble in aqua regia and whatever. We say, you know, um, the gold atom has whatever, I forget how many <laughs> um, uh, protons in its nucleus. Um, and that's how we sort things into gold and not gold. So uh, does that mean we, we did learn the real constitution as Locke understands it, or is it is there still, do we still face some other version of the problem he's talking about? I don't know. Anyway, that's interesting, but that's all I'm going to say about it. Um, going back to Locke, he says, we'll never know what that real constitution is. So we can't use it to sort things. So what do we use to sort them? Well, we sort them using our idea, right? So the reason we don't call this cow a horse is because it doesn't cause the right, me to perceive the right simple ideas. Um, so this real constitution that all the horses have in common is what Locke calls the real essence. Of the sort or species horse. So there is a real essence, he's saying. There certainly is something they all have in common. We know what kind of thing it must be because they're bodies, and we know that bodies only have the primary qualities. So it has something to do with the size, shape, motion, etc., of their of their tiny parts. Um, but we haven't collected them all together because we know they have the same real essence. Um, we, you know, we couldn't, first of all, because we don't know the real essence. And second of all, this, again, you might ask, do we still face a version of this problem? Or is there something about the way we define gold, let's say, that gets us out of this? And is it different with gold and with horse? Anyway, getting back to Locke, Locke says, number one, we don't know the real essence. Number two, even if we did know the real essence, so, you know, these things have something in common, right? There's something similar about the way that the size, shape, motion of their small parts, but they're also different from each other, of course. Which is why not all horses look the same, right? Not all horses look the same means the real constitution of the horses must be different. That is the size, shape, motion, et cetera, of their tiny parts must be different or else they would all look exactly the same and have exactly the same properties. So these things have some real essence in common and they differ with respect to some other real essence. And moreover, this thing, which we don't call a horse, has something in common with these things. In fact, if you picked the right property of the, the right aspect of the size, shape, motion, et cetera, of the tiny parts, you might find that these two things have it in common, and this one doesn't have it with that. So even if we knew the real essence, it wouldn't tell us how to sort things. So, um, you know, therefore, uh, what does tell us how to sort things is our abstract idea. Um, 
which Locke calls the nominal essence. Right? It's called the nominal essence because it's the abstract idea that our word or name horse stands for. Um, and <laughs> this is confusing, but I mean, the, the real essence isn't really the essence of the sort horse. The, <laughs> the nominal essence is really the essence. That is, it's by, by virtue of their conformity to the nominal essence that they all count as the same kind of thing, not by virtue of the real essence that they have in common. Because again, we don't know the real essence, so we didn't use that to sort them, and we never use that to sort them. And number two, even if we did know it, it wouldn't be good for that. You would have to first decide what properties were important, and then you could, you know, um, if you knew the real essence, you would know exactly what you were saying about the horses when you said they have those properties in common. But you would still have to start by deciding which properties are significant for sorting, and that would be your abstract idea. Okay, are there any questions about that? That, again, was from stuff I didn't get to talk about last time. Okay, so I'm gonna go on to talk about knowledge. Right, so the main thesis of book four, book four is about knowledge and probability. So I'm gonna talk about probability um, more next time, I think, than this time, but, um, uh, but, it seems pretty clear that Locke uh, is more interested in knowledge than probability. Um, even though he says we have very little knowledge and we mostly rely on probability. Right, and so again, like for Locke, knowledge involves certainty. Um, and not certainty as a kind of subjective thing, like I feel really certain, because probability can yield that, but knowledge means um, in some sense, perceiving that a, that a proposition is certainly true. So if you have that kind of certainty, you can't be wrong. You so to speak, see that the proposition is true. And so it's true. <laughs> All right. Um, and the, the main thesis of book four, which he states in the first section of book four on page 467, is... Uh, Our knowledge is only conversant about them, that is, about ideas. I should have started here, maybe. Since the mind, in all its thoughts and reasonings, has no other immediate object but its own ideas, it is evident that our knowledge is only conversant about them, that is, about ideas. So this is parallel to the main thesis of book three, right? The main thesis of book three was that our words signify only our own ideas. That is, a word signifies only ideas in the mind of the speaker. And the thesis of book four is that our knowledge is only about our own ideas. And more specifically, just going on here, Knowledge then seems to be nothing but the perception of the connection and agreement or disagreement and repugnancy of any of our ideas.
right? So uh, knowledge is conversant about ideas. And the way it's conversant about ideas is that knowledge consists in perceiving the agreement What am I drawing here? I don't know. Um, there's not an intro. Agreement or repugnancy of ideas. I mean, so there's actually four terms there, right? It says the connection or agreements um, and repugnancy, um, sorry, connection and agreement or disagreement and repugnancy. I take it that connection and agreement are supposed to be like alternate names for the same thing and similarly disagreement and repugnancy. Um, I mean, that's a good example of a passage where there's a question about which way to read it. Are those four separate things or is it just two things and there's two names for each of them? So I'm saying I think it's the latter, right? So there's, so th there's two things that knowledge is about. It's about the agreement of ideas or it's about the repugnancy of ideas. And again, as I was saying, it consists in perceiving the agreement or repugnancy so that um, when you have knowledge, you, uh, so to speak, see that the ideas agree with each other or that they disagree with each other. So this results in a two-way classification of um knowledge and apparently this is completely cross-cutting um so on the one hand you can uh classify knowledge according to the way we perceive the agreement or disagreements and the ways that Locke discusses, although later it turns out there's another one. But the way, this says sensibly, right? But the ways Locke mostly discusses are intuitive and demonstrative. So the difference between these is supposed to be that in the case of intuitive knowledge, you directly perceive the agreement or repugnancy of the ideas. Um, so you just have the two ideas, kind of look at them together. Now, I mean, as I've said before, um, this looking at uh, is, it's not literal looking at, because literal looking at is mediated by an idea, right? So we don't look at ideas. We look at other things by having ideas. Um, so it's not literally looking at, and it's kind of actually better than literally looking at because there's no intermediary. Um, but in any case, in the case of intuitive knowledge, you, so to speak, look at the two ideas next to each other and you can see whether they agree or disagree. So like, for example, Locke says, the knowledge that white is not black is intuitive. Just have the idea of white and the idea of black and you'll see that they're not the same idea, end of story. Whereas demonstrative knowledge is, the way Locke explains it is, that other ideas have to go in between. So you, you have idea A and idea B, and you look at them together and you can't tell whether they agree or disagree. 
but you can find an intermediate idea C, and you can see that A agrees with C, and you can see that B agrees with C. So these two are intuitive. But then by putting them together, you get the demonstrative perception that A agrees with B. That's how a demonstration works. Hopefully, I'll give you an example of a demonstration later. Um, but first, I'm going to talk about the other classification. right? So this classification, again, is how we perceive the agreement or repugnancy. And like these seem to exhaust the possibilities, right? Either you see it directly or you see it, you know, by mediation of something else. But then it turns out that there's this other possibility called sensitive, and uh, um, which is somehow different from both of them. Um, I'm not going to say more about that for now. But there's also a classification according to the type of agreement and disagreement. Maybe I should have drawn up the other one. This is one classification. But the other one is by type of agreement or disagreement. And there's four types according to Locke. So the first one is identity and difference. The second one is relation. The third one is coexistence. And the last one is real existence. Um, so I'll just say here for the benefit of people who are also in 106 or who take 106 or read Kant on their own or whatever, that these correspond to Kant's categories of quantity, quality, relation, and modality. Right, this this is a little tricky because I would say Kant's category of relation actually corresponds to what Locke calls coexistence, whereas what Locke calls relation corresponds to what Kant calls quality. Um, um, and uh, you can see that correspondence better by looking at what Kant calls the pure concepts of reflection, it's in the amphiboly of the pure concepts of reflection, um, in which the first one actually is identity and difference. Um, but, uh, um, but those four concepts of reflection correspond to the categories. So, uh, so therefore you can see that they correspond to the categories. Um, in some past years, I've spent a long time talking about that, which is not probably a good thing for this course, since it's not a course about Kant, and so I won't say anything more about that. And I'll go on to talk about what Locke says about these four kinds, four kinds of agreement and disagreement. Um, so identity and difference, or sorry, he calls it identity and diversity. Identity and diversity is the easiest one to understand. Well, although there's a little bit of a problem about identity, but um, but this is supposed to cover an example like white is not black. They're not the same idea. So they're not identical, they're diverse, right? Remember again, ident identical means the same. Right, so identity means sameness, and if you have two ideas and they're not the same, then they're diverse. 
Um, now, I mean, the weird thing about the identity side of it is that, um, as usual with identity, there aren't really two different things. <laughs> um, so uh, there's only one idea. Right, so white is white might seem like an example of something we know by identity, but Locke is going to say, um, and this is in the reading for next time, that um, identical propositions like that actually don't contain any knowledge. Um, that they're merely verbal. Right, that all we've done is repeat the same word because uh, there's no agreement between two ideas there. There's just one idea. I mean, uh, that's interesting because it, it says something about how we're thinking about ideas here, right? Like you might think, I mean, we know when we form simple modes that you can have the same idea several times. Right, so like those different instances of the idea are different from each other somehow. Um, but that doesn't count for as different ideas for these purposes. If they're exact same kind of idea, then it's just one idea and there's nothing to know about its agreement with itself, according to Locke. Um, he's also gonna say, um, in that same chapter for next time that, right, so a, a good example of this is white is not black. And white is not black is intuitive. White is white is not an example of this because it's not an example of knowledge at all. Uh, at all. And um, similarly, he's going to say that Gold is yellow. Assuming yellow is part of the definition of gold is also not an example, right? He's also going to classify that as a trifling proposition. Um, that's the kind of thing that Kant calls an analytic judgment. And Although he agrees, Kant agrees that it doesn't extend our knowledge, he doesn't think it's trifling. Why doesn't he think it's trifling? Or why does Locke think it's trifling? Well, so um, this is a general thing that's at work. It's a disagreement between Locke and Leibniz, really. Um, Locke, I think we've seen this before, although I don't know if I've called sufficient attention to it. Locke doesn't believe in unconscious um, ideas, right? He thinks that it, having an, an idea being in the mind means being conscious of it. So that extends also to the components of complex ideas. That is, Locke thinks if you have the complex idea in your mind, that means you have all its components in your mind. And so you have nothing more to learn about what its components are. If it seems like you're confused and don't know exactly what components are in the idea, Locke says you're really confused about the names. You don't know which idea to attach the name to. And that's why a proposition like gold is yellow, Locke is going to classify as verbal, right? It's just a matter of explaining the meaning of the word gold. But if you have the idea of gold in your mind, you can't um, not notice that it's yellow. Whereas Kant agrees with Leibniz and thinks that we can have ideas in our mind that where like um, the, 
they're confused the 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 components of them are like fused together <laughs> and we're not and we need to take them apart to see what they are and that's the process of analysis okay so anyway um so therefore Locke doesn't count an example like this and so it seems like and he actually says this really all the knowledge that we get from this type of agreement and disagreement is negative and apparently it's all intuitive right like it's not clear how you could get a demonstration going here so this type of knowledge is basically limited to things like white is not black um or gold is not not yellow or something like that i i mean no, i guess that doesn't count either but um gold is not green <laughs> i mean um which is true because yellow is not green um is that a demonstration i don't think Locke would count that as a demonstration Okay, so that's the first type of agreement and disagreement. If that was the only kind, then we wouldn't be getting very far with our knowledge. I mean, Locke says we have a lot of knowledge of this type, right? Because, or we can have a lot because any two ideas that are not the same, we can know they're not the same. So we can have a, like an infinite amount of this knowledge, but it's not very useful. <laughs> um, so um, the second kind is about what you might call, and this is the connection to quality, you might call it the qualitative agreement or disagreement of ideas. Um, right, the two ideas are different, but they have something in common. I mean, at least one example of this Perhaps the only example, but that's not clear. But at least one example of this is that what the that the sense in which they're different but have something in common is that they differ in degree of something. Um, and so, uh, um, well. Well, I guess I shouldn't say. I say. Let me give the example and see if I'm saying it right. Um, so I think. Um, But um, three angles of a triangle are equal to right angles. So I think actually, I'm sure this goes under this kind of agreement and disagreement. This relationship of equality. Yeah, so it's, they have the same degree of different things, so to speak, I guess, right? I mean, in this case, of course, we actually call what they have degrees, <laughs> right? They, ha they have the same number of degrees, <laughs> um, the three angles, um, so the 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 three angles the the three angles of the triangle is not the same idea as two right angles, right? The the idea of the three angles of the triangle some is you know somehow I mean it's not just a picture exactly, but we somehow see what it is in this picture. Those are the three angles of the triangle. These are two right angles. It's not the same idea. But nevertheless, we know that these two ideas have a common quality. They have a common amount of something. 
and again, what they have a common amount of in this case is degrees. <laughs> um, right, so Locke says, um, Um, like Locke explicitly assigns to relation a somewhat different triangle example. This is um, on page 469, book four, chapter one, section seven. No, not section. Oh. oh, yeah. Two triangles upon equal basis. Bases, we would say, I guess. Two triangles upon equal basis between two parallels are equal is of relation. Right, that's something that's classified as where the agreement or disagreement is in relation. So, right, that example is that you have two parallel lines and you have these two segments are equal and you draw two triangles. So the ideas of these two triangles are not the same, right? So by identity and diversity, all we would know is this, this triangle is not like this triangle. But they have the same area. That's what he means when he says they're equal. So that that's classified as relation. So it's again, even though they're different ideas, they have the same amount of something. And what I was trying to say before is, I'm not sure if that's the only example or if there's other examples, but it's certainly a really important example, equality. Um, that this, this means that basically like all mathematical knowledge is knowledge of relation. Um, And um, so this example I wrote over here because it's demonstrative. And again, I hope later I got a chance to show you the demonstration and explain how Locke understands the demonstration. Um, but there's also intuitive knowledge of relation, right? Like I think one example of intuitive knowledge of relation, um, this is book for us, chapter seven, um, section 14. So I guess this is actually in the reading for next time. Um, write down the page number. After 17, section 14. Yeah. Thus, the mind perceives that an arch, we would say arc, that an arch of a circle is less than the whole circle, as clearly as it does the idea of a circle. And this, therefore, as has been said, I call intuitive knowledge, which is certain beyond all doubt and needs no probation, that is, doesn't need to be proved. Um, right, so he's using that example that the arc of a circle is less than the whole circle because one of the um, one of the traditional axioms of Euclidean geometry 
is the whole is less than the part. And in that place in chapter 17, he's engaged in arguing that he, although he agrees we can be intuitively certain that the whole is less than the part, he says, we don't use that principle to prove, for example, that the arc of a circle is less than the whole circle, because this itself is intuitively certain and it doesn't need any proof. So but in the present context, we learn that this is a matter of relation, or in this case, it's not equality, but less than, and it's intuitively certain. I think this is also important because probably, although I don't know anywhere he says this, it seems like Locke probably thinks that knowledge about angles is knowledge about arcs of circles, right? So that we're really saying here is that if you add together, if you take, um, Well, see, it doesn't depend on the radius exactly, but if you take the length of this arc and the length of this arc and the length of this arc, you know, given a certain radius here, and you take this arc with the same radius here, you'll find that this is equal to this plus this plus this, those like pieces of circles. Um, and that kind of thing can be proved because we already know certain intuitive things about arcs of circles. For example, that, that any arc is less than or equal to the whole circle. Um, okay, so that's relation. Um, so this, like if nothing else, the knowledge of relation is the basis of all our mathematical knowledge. What about coexistence or necessary relation? Well, so this has to do with substances. Um, going back to page, that that I was just reading, by the way, from chapter 17 was on page uh, 603. But now I'm going back. For page 468. Thirdly, the third sort of agreement or disagreement to be found in our ideas, which the perception of the mind is employed about, is coexistence or non-coexistence in the same subject. And this belongs particularly to substances. Um, why does it belong particularly? And I think particularly here means, uh, I think particularly here means only, right? That is, I, I think it means um, it's particular to substances. Um, and because as I pointed out some time ago, you know, like uh, although um, the idea of substance in general is the idea of a something we know not what that underlies all the different qualities in the object. The, um, I, the idea of any kind of substances, any sort of substances, is the idea of um, certain qualities always going together. due to something about the object. But again, as we were just talking about, we don't know what <laughs> about the object, um, but still we attribute it to something in the object. This, um, I hope you're not too annoyed. I, I know that most people are either in 106 or 100C and not both, but I can't help, you know, like, 
this is the exact same thing I was just talking about in the 106 lecture when Kant says that uh, the copula in a judgment represents uh, or places the two representations together in the object. Um, okay, so um, that's what this knowledge would be like. Um, so like, here's an example. The exact same place. I was just reading. Thus, when we pronounce concerning gold that it is fixed, right? So fixed means that it's not consumed in fire, or in other words, that it has a really high evaporation point. I think Locke actually um, is aware, sometimes he talks about it being relatively fixed, right? That is, he's aware that things are not either fixed or not fixed. It just depends how hot you get them. Eventually they'll evaporate. Um, but in any case, that's what fixed means. That's when we pronounce concerning gold that it is fixed. Our knowledge of this truth amounts to no more but this, that fixedness or a power to remain in the fire unconsumed is an idea that always accompanies and is joined with that particular sort of yellowness, weight, fusibility, Right, fusibility means it melts. Malleableness, that means you can shape it with a hammer. And solubility in aqua regia, which make our complex idea signified by the word, word gold. Okay, so uh, that's the kind of knowledge we would have by this uh, third uh, type of agreement and disagreement. Question, how do we know that about gold? So remember, for it to be knowledge, we would have to perceive the agreement or disagreements of the ideas, right? So in this case, one idea would be our idea of gold, assuming that fixed wasn't part of the idea of gold. If fixed is part of the idea, then this would be a trifling proposition, right? That is, if I defined gold as a substance, yellow, heavy, uh, fusible, fixed, malleable, and soluble in aqua regia, and then I said gold is fixed, or all gold is fixed, I wouldn't be telling you anything new. It would be a trifling proposition. But if I don't include it in the idea, that I am telling you something new. It depends on the ideas in the mind of the speaker. That is, you have to know how I define gold to know whether I'm telling you something or not. And that might seem strange, but I think if you think about it more, you'll realize that that makes sense. And that, like, if, if by gold I mean something fixed, and I say gold is fixed, then I'm not telling you anything I'm, other than my definition of the word gold. But if it's not part of my definition of the word gold, and I tell you gold is fixed, then I mean, as Locke says, that whatever has these characteristics also has this one. And that might or not be true. So I'm telling you, if I'm right, I'm telling you something that you would might not have known before. Right, so that's what this type of knowledge is supposed to be like. But the question is, how by comparing the idea of yellow, fusible, malleable, and soluble in aqua regia to the idea of fixed, how do I perceive their agreement? And if I don't perceive their agreement, then I don't know, because that was part of the definition of knowledge. Well, so the answer is, according to Locke, that, yeah, we don't know that. <laughs> um, so that wasn't really an example of knowledge. It was an example of purported knowledge, I guess, right? Because if you go on to um, 
chapter three, section 14, on page 485. Um, Thus, though we see that, that the yellow color and upon trial find the weight, malleableness, fusibility, and fixedness that are united in a piece of gold. I'm oh, sorry. Thus, although we see the yellow color and upon trial find the weight, malleableness, fusibility, and fixedness, that are united in a piece of gold, yet because no one of these ideas has any evident dependence or necessary connection with the other, we cannot certainly know that where any four of them are, the fifth will be there also. Oops, and I was always pointing to stuff that you couldn't see. Let me read that again. Thus, Though we see the yellow color and upon trial find the weight, malleableness, fusibility, and fixedness that are united in a piece of gold, yet because no one of these ideas has any evident dependence or necessary connection with the other, we cannot certainly know that where any four of them are, the fifth will, there, will be there also. Right. So the example that he gave in chapter one of um, uh, knowing that all gold is fixed, meaning knowing that what has the, the yellowness, fusibility, malleable, malleability, and whatever also always has fixedness. He's saying right here in chapter three, we don't know that. We can't certainly know, which means we can't know, right? Because knowledge, uh, at least as Locke usually uses the term, in, involves certainty, perception of agreement. We don't have any perception of agreement. And he says, um, therefore, um, uh, for the same reason, we have almost no knowledge of this kind. Right, this is chapter three, section 10 on page 483. This, how weighty and considerable a part soever of human science, is yet very narrow and scarce any at all. The reason whereof is that the simple ideas whereof our complex ideas of substances are made up are for the most part such as carry with them in their own nature no visible necessary connection or inconsistency with any other simple ideas whose coexistence with them we would inform ourselves about. Right, so all the things we would like to know about substances, which are all things about what ideas necessarily coexist with what others, that is, and again, what he really means here is the qualities that cause us to perceive the ideas, right? We want to know whether certain qualities necessarily go together because of the nature of the substrate, the substance that they're in, but we mostly don't know that. Because we compare our ideas, our complex idea of a certain kind of substance with some other idea, and we see no necessary connection between them. That is, we don't see that they agree or disagree in this respect of the necessary coexistence of their causes. And therefore, we don't have the knowledge. At best, we have probability. Um, and in particular, it's impossible that we would ever know that about secondary qualities. Because, um, as Locke explains, there's really, there's two reasons for it. First of all, we don't know what is the real constitution that's responsible for the secondary qualities, right? So we don't know what feature of the texture it is the bulk motion and uh, uh, shape of the um, particles in the surface of some body are responsible for our perception of yellow. 
And since we don't know that, we can't possibly know what other qualities have to go together with yellow. But Locke says there's also another problem, which is that even if we did know that, we wouldn't understand why it produces the sensation of yellow. He says we can't, we never understand, we, we never could understand that. We don't understand why um, we get certain ideas because of certain uh, texture of external bodies. Um, like what could be possibly be the connection between a certain bulk, size, figure, motion, et cetera, of tiny insensible parts and that sensation of yellowness? So since we don't understand that, we could, even if we knew what was usually behind our perception of yellow, we couldn't be sure that it couldn't sometimes also follow from something else, I think, is the point. Um, so, um, so here, you know, as far as Locke is concerned, as far as these secondary qualities are concerned, um, we basically already have the whole problem of induction that we're going to see in Hume. Um, right? We know that we find certain ideas are constantly conjoined, but we can't, based on that, find, form a knowledge of necessary coexistence of their causes in the object. Um, and instead, um, so this is uh, chapter three, back to chapter three, section 14 on page 485. For this coexistence can be no further known than it is perceived, and it cannot be perceived but either in particular subjects by the observation of our senses or in general by the necessary connection. Is that what I wanted to read? Yeah, or in general, by the necessary connection of the ideas themselves. But since there is no necessary connection between the ideas of secondary qualities, we can only um, know the coexistence of these qualities in particular subjects insofar as we observe them. So I know this yellow heavy thing is fixed and this yellow heavy thing is fixed and this yellow heavy thing is fixed, but I can't know that all the yellow heavy things are fixed. I can't conclude, I have no way of concluding from the particulars to the universal, which is what I wanna know. And then the question is going to be, you know, okay, but how can I um, come to the probable conclusion? How does this, how am I, can I build up evidence that all the yellow heavy things are fixed? And Locke doesn't really say anything about that, but that's, that's where he leaves the question. There's, there's some way of doing that, and that's what our knowledge of substances amounts to. Except, and now this is something I read to you a long time ago in order to explain what primary qualities were when we encountered them in book two. Um, but now here it comes in its correct place. Some few of the primary qualities have a necessary dependence and visible connection one with another as figure necessarily supposes extension, receiving or communicating motion by impulse supposes solidity. So there is a basis for knowledge of substances. Namely, if we know them by their primary qualities. Now, I mean, the primary qualities are so for something like gold um for something like gold it's figure bulk motion whatever have nothing to do with the definition of it 
right? A piece of gold can be any, at least as far as Locke knows, can be any shape or size, can move in any way, and it will still be gold. So the fact that uh, we see necessary connections between primary qualities is not going to help us know anything about gold. Now, of course, in the case of a horse, well, its primary qualities do have something to do with our definition of it, right? And in fact, remember, Locke said that our leading idea of the of living substances is usually their shape. So that's a primary quality. So we do know certain things about horses, that, right? We can know certain things in general about this, about this sort of substances, but they're not very important things, right? It's something like how its surface area is related to its volume and stuff like that. Um, it's not going to take us very far into the type of thing we would like to know about horses. Like, for example, why is it that um, horses can't subsist on a diet of meat, whereas lions can? So Locke says, um, that won't be found in our abstract idea of horse. There's no necessary connection between our idea of horse and that, you know, um, requiring a vegetable diet. So all we can say is so far, they seem that they mostly are like that. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, but there is one kind of substance that's defined totally in terms of primary qualities, namely body. Right, so, and he he discusses this example finally on page 526. So it's uh, book four, chapter seven, section five. Secondly, so as he goes on in the book, he, he switches the order. He starts deciding, discussing coexistence second and relation third. I don't know why. Anyway, so that's why this is secondly. Secondly, as to coexistence or such a necessary connection between two ideas, then the subject where one of them is supposed, there the other must necessarily be also. Of such agreement or disagreement as this, the mind has an immediate perception, but in very few of them. And therefore, in this sort, we have but very little intuitive knowledge, nor are there to be found very many propositions that are self-evident, though some there are. For example, the idea of filling a place equal to the contents of its superficies being annexed to our idea of body, I think it is a self-evident proposition the two bodies cannot be in the same place. Right, so we do know certain things about bodies um, because we perceive the visible necessary connection between the primary qualities. Um, and uh, Although that's very no narrow, I think Locke believes that that's the basis of our knowledge of physics. Right, so like, this is mathematics. Whereas this, right, all our knowledge of mathematics is agreement and disagreement of ideas in relation. All our knowledge of physics, that is mechanistic physics, is based on our 
knowledge of coexistence of primary qualities. Um, this implies that uh, Locke thinks that Newtonian Newtonian theory of gravitation um, and perhaps even Newtonian rules of like force and momentum and whatever are not um, don't constitute knowledge but only probability whereas our knowledge of physics is is car is confined to mechanism that is that bodies push each other um, um Okay, so that's the third type of agreement and disagreement of ideas. Are there questions about this? This is your chance because Josephine isn't here. The, the rest of you can all ask questions if you want. <laughs> um, all right, well, um, if not, I will go on to the fourth one, which is real existence. Now, this is the uh, weirdest one because so right here, actual real existence, you go back to the way he defines it at the beginning of book one. getting dark in here. Let me go. The fourth and last sort is that of actual real existence agreeing to any idea. Now, I thought that our knowledge is only conversant with ideas. That's what he said, right? So there should be an agreement of two ideas. And yet it sounds like now we're talking about the agreement of something else with the idea. Right? So like under this fourth kind is going to come things like... Um, uh, I exist, um, God exists, and if I'm looking at something white, something white exists. <laughs> um, so it seems like what we have here is an agreement between an idea, say white, and something that's not an idea, like this piece of paper. And we're saying that actual real existence agrees with the idea. But it can't mean that because the general definition of knowledge is that it's about agreement of ideas. And it also can't mean that because how could we perceive this? I mean, we can perceive the paper, the paper is an external object. So we can perceive the paper only by means of ideas. Now here, if we want to say that the paper agrees with the idea of white, we want to say, I don't know. That doesn't even look like. Okay, so this is the idea of white. And this is the paper. And we want to say that the paper agrees. We want to say 
that I perceive the agreement of the paper with the idea of white, that is, that I perceive that the paper actually is white. But I can only perceive that the paper is white insofar as the paper causes a perception of white in me. So I'm really just comparing this idea to itself, right? There is no agreement or disagreement here, if that's what it meant. Therefore, it can't mean that. Okay, well, uh, Locke does offer an answer to um, some questions about that pretty clearly. I mean, first of all, he certainly raises the question. This is uh, book four, chapter four, section three on page 499. How shall the mind, when it perceives nothing but its own ideas, know that they agree with things themselves? Right? So that there's the question. The mind perceives only its own ideas. So how is it supposed to perceive the agreement of the ideas with things? Um... So, um, so one answer that he gives is, well, uh, take the case where my idea functions as the archetype. Now, this is where I wish I had gotten a chance to talk about adequate and inadequate ideas at towards the end of book two. That's where he introduces these terms archetype and ectype. Um, but uh, you know what? Type really means like um, um, an impression. And the metaphor here is, I think, of um, like, I don't know, like, let's say you make coins by stamping them. So you have the archetype is the stamp. <laughs> and the stamped coins are the ectypes. Right? So archa means, the, ar arche here means like, original or beginning and act is like out of right so you there's the original impression that you use to make all the other impressions that's the metaphor but so what does it mean in this case when we talk about the archetype in, in of an idea being an archetype versus an idea being an ectype so Locke says like in the case of um modes the idea is the archetype, meaning like, um, I guess you could think of it this way, like if you want to know if this coin is genuine, you can compare it to the archetype. So the idea is the archetype means that the idea is the, is the um, standard to which other things have to conform if they're going to count as um, objects of the idea. And he says, right, so like the idea of triangle, which is supposed to be an idea of a mode, right? It's a simple mode, um, is an example of an idea that's an archetype. So Locke says, 
the things we know about triangles, which fall under this relation, um, that, you know, by knowing those about triangles, we know something about reality if it contains a triangle, <laughs> right? Because if there is any triangle, then it has to conform to the idea because the idea is the archetype. So, I mean, uh, sure enough that from that we know something about the agreement of ideas and things, but it, it's it's not the kind of thing we were trying to know here, right? Because what we know is not that there is a triangle, right? That is, that would be this mode of real existence. What we know is just that if there's a triangle, it's, you know, it's various uh, properties are related to each other in a certain way. So, um, so that's not helping. Um, moreover, in the case of ideas of substances, Locke says that the archetype is the thing. Meaning that, like, we're we're trying to form an idea of gold that will, like, um, correctly correspond to the things that we. I mean, it's a little hard how to to know how to state this in Locke's terms. After all, the, the idea of gold is the nominal essence. Right, so it's still, it can't be wrong about gold. Um, but I mean, nevertheless, we're trying to adapt it to certain things. I guess you could say like the things that we've customarily called gold or something like that. We're trying to come up with the right meaning for that word so that the things we want to call gold and nothing else will all uh, correspond to it. Um, so in that sense, we don't know that we have the right one. That is, we don't know if we've defined gold correctly. Now, again, like seems like Locke is going to have trouble taking that completely seriously. But um, in any case, uh, um, it doesn't, uh, it seems like it's even worse than the case of triangles in some way. Um, and uh, Locke says that all we can really say in in this type of relation, like how it's how it gives us knowledge of things and not just of our ideas, is that well, at least we know that um, the simple ideas that have coexisted at one time could coexist at another time. Um. So in that sense, we know if we form an idea of something that's yo that's heavy, yellow, malleable, etc., we don't know if there ever will be one again. But at least we know that it's not a complete chimera; that it's not an idea of something impossible that's never happened and never will, because we did see those ideas coexisting once. Um. Okay, but um, uh, those things, I mean, first of all, don't really get at this. And on the other hand, they don't seem to make sense unless we can get at this. I mean, like, what are we even asking? We ask if real triangles agree with my idea. Like, how are we able to compare them? So, um, 
I'm not going to get into this a lot because I do want to still talk about intuition versus demonstration. And there's only like seven minutes left or something. Um, I think the answer is that Locke actually thinks, and this is going to be important, and we, we, we saw him say this in book two, that there is an idea of existence. So when we perceive that white exists, we're perceiving the agreement that there is between the idea of white and the idea of existence. So it does fit the general definition. Now you might say, what do you mean? There's an agreement between the idea of white and the idea of existence. Wouldn't that mean that white necessarily exists? There's, I mean, if these ideas are ever related this way, aren't they always related this way? And I think the, roughly speaking, the answer is, well, no, I mean, this type of existence, this type of agreement is a, is a kind of contingent agreement. Um, it's, white doesn't always agree with existence. I mean, it does and it doesn't. White always agrees with existence when I actually have the idea of white. <laughs> That is, whenever I have the idea of white, the idea of white exists. And so it agrees with existence. Now, I mean, so far, that's only about ideal existence, right? The existence of the idea. But I think Locke further believes that whenever I have the idea of white, existence agrees with its object. Now, does that mean there's always something white when I have the idea of white? No, but there always either is or was something white because the mind can't make its own new simple ideas. So I do perceive the relationship that there is between the idea of white and the existence of its objects. Namely, that white couldn't exist unless the quality that causes me to perceive white exists now or existed in the past. All right. That's, uh, I should say a lot more about that, but I won't because I want to say, I want to give that example of a demonstration and explain how Locke thinks the demonstration works. So, I mean, because, so that's about this distinction between intuitive and demonstrative knowledge. Hopefully at least some of this stuff will come back next time, but we can talk about the proof of the existence of God and some other stuff, but I don't know how much I'll get to. So, all right, well, let me not draw these lines yet. So how do you prove that the three internal angles of a triangle are equal to two right angles? So Locke says, you can't do it by comparing the three internal angles of a triangle to two right angles, because this is only two angles and this is three angles. <laughs> no matter what you do, you can't put them all together. So how do you prove this? Well, so here, this roughly speaking is how Euclid proves it. I'm changing it a little bit. So first you draw a line, let's say this triangle is ABC. So you draw a line parallel to AB through C. Okay, so far so good. Now, um, Because these two lines are parallel, this angle is equal to this angle. And, and 
this angle is equal to this angle. And therefore, these three angles are equal to these three angles. But these three angles are angles on a straight line, and so they're equal to two right angles. That's the proof. And the way Locke understands this proof is, again, that there's two ideas, right? On one end is the idea of the three angles. of a triangle, the three internal angles of a triangle. And on the other right, other end is the idea of two right angles. And I can't compare them directly, but I can compare both of them to this other idea. What is this other idea? So in this case, the intermediate idea is these three angles. These three angles is what I'm writing. So the demonstration works by, well, so this Locke almost certainly thinks is intuitive. That the that that these, well, I should actually draw it this way. That these three angles add up to the same as these two angles, right? It, it's a matter of saying that no matter how you get the entire arc of the circle, the, the semicircle, whether you get it in three pieces or two pieces, it's always the same length. That Locke probably thinks is intuitive. This, I don't know. Although I've worked a lot on trying to understand <laughs> um, why, how Locke thinks we know this. Maybe he also thinks this is intuitive, but probably not. He probably thinks you have to put more intermediate ideas in here. But anyway, you get the general idea of, well, so to speak, of how this how a demonstration is going to work. Um, okay. Uh, that is all I have time for. So I will see you on Wednesday. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.